Well, welcome to what is a very exciting topic. So the changes to cervical cancer screening are one of the great medical advances of our time. And we're very fortunate to be in a country that is leading the way in that area. So we've got lots to talk about. Um, firstly, though, I'd like to acknowledge some colleagues. I would like to acknowledge Professor Ian Hammond and Dr. Carolyn Harvey, who I've done a lot of work with in this area, and we share slides with each other, which is very helpful. I would also like to thank the Cervical Renewal Task Force, who've provided updates on sort of the, the latest changes that have occurred, particularly since the um, renewal came into place in the, on the 1st of December last year. So just a broad overview, so um, our previous cervical screening program, which you're all very, very familiar with, of course, was our two yearly pap smear. And we started sexually active women between the ages of 18 and 20. Uh, finishing at age 69, we have had, of course, state-based registers, and we've used a reminder system. So now we've moved to the cervical screening test, which is a HPV primary screening test. It's five yearly intervals, starting later at 25, ending between 70 and 74. We're moving to a national register and to invitations as well as reminders. And we have this option of self-collection as well. So we're going to look at all of this in quite a bit of detail. So overall, we're going to think about the rationale for this change that has occurred. In particular, the test itself, the age range and the interval. We're going to talk about HPV, which I have to confess I'm very passionate about. Um, and this is what this topic is all about. You have got to understand HPV very well. And then we're going to talk about the uh, new national cervical screening policies themselves and how they apply in clinical practice. Then we'll mention briefly the new national cancer screening register. And at the end, as Leslie mentioned, I've just got a few clinical cases that we can work through together that should work really nicely in this small group, um, just to put everything into that clinical context and hopefully give you a chance to ask some of your questions. This is an overview of what has happened with cervical screening in Australia. So uh, from sort of 1980 to recently, to start with, we had just opportunistic screening and you can see that as expected, didn't achieve a great deal. In 1991, we started our organised approach to prevention of cervical cancer using the two yearly pap smear. And we had marked reduction in the incidence and mortality of cervical cancer in Australia. So it was a 50% reduction. But if you have a look at this graph a little bit more closely, you can see that that's actually plateaued in recent years. So um, we haven't continued this very impressive reduction in more recent times. The other thing that's really important to be mindful of is participation, one of our biggest problems in Australia. So our two yearly participation rate has, has only been about 58%, but encouragingly, our five year participation rate is much higher, it's 83%. If you break down the cancer details a little bit more, you can see that the reduction has been exclusively in squamous cell carcinoma. Now that's not surprising, squamous cell carcinoma is the dominant form of cervical cancer, and that's the type of precancer changes that the pap smear was designed to detect. So all of that massive reduction has occurred in squamous cell carcinoma. This light blue line is the adenocarcinomas, and you can see over all of this time of organised screening, we've not made any difference to adenocarcinoma. So it's becoming increasingly significant and now accounts for 25% of the cases of cervical cancer. There are other much rarer types of cervical cancer, and again, our screening programs do not have an impact on those very rare types of cancer. This is looking globally, so if we compare ourselves to other Western countries, we're doing pretty well, but we could still do better. We are still behind New Zealand and Finland in terms of our incidence and mortality rates. How is it? 
So you can see we've done a lot of great work, but there is still improvements to be made. So those things on top of other reasons are why we've come to this renewal. So we've got um, a great increase in knowledge on HPV and its role in the development of cervical cancer. So we understand that a lot more. We've also got very good evidence about cervical cancer prevention and screening and the best way to do those things. Um, we've got the availability of new technologies, so particularly the liquid-based cytolo cytology, the um, computer-assisted analysis, and of course HPV testing. And we've had the huge advance of primary prevention in the form of vaccination, so all of these have, have an impact. So our screening program as it was, was very intensive compared to many other countries. There are three major legends in this field. So there's George first, George Papanicolo, who came up with the PAP test in 1928. Um, it was doing something a little bit different at the beginning, but that was really the start of us thinking about screening to prevent cervical, uh, cervical and other genital cancers it was actually at the time. And then there was Harold Zerhausen, who in 1982 was able to demonstrate that HPV was the cause of cervical cancer. He had to wait till 2008 to get his Nobel Prize in Medicine. Our third legend, of course, is the man we like to claim as our own, despite his very significant Scottish accent, and that's Ian Fraser, who, along with his partner, Jian Zhu, uh, develop this vaccination for HPV, so the first primary prevention against cancer. It is an extraordinary thing. So he's probably got a little while yet to wait for his Nobel Prize. So we've got a lot of new things as a result of all of this. We've got our new screening test based on testing for oncogenic HPV. We've got a new screening interval of five years. We've got a new starting age, a new finishing age. We've got the new possibility of self-collection and we have a new national register. So we've got a lot of new challenges. There's, there's great information on the government website about all of these things. The link here is to the screening program policies. And so you can find all of the detail that you want at these links. They're very easy to get to. And you'll see we've included other links throughout of other useful information. We're moving to a nucleic acid test for HPV. And we're going to talk about this more, but broadly, this is a much more sensitive test. So we have a much lower chance of false negatives. We're looking for the causative organism. So we've got a greater opportunity for earlier detection. We're going to prevent more cervical cancer because we're looking for the cause of it. But also in particular, HPV testing gives us the potential to reduce invasive adenocarcinoma, which you see we've not been able to impact to date. And that's because adenocarcinoma is even more linked to the oncogenic types of HPV than squamous cell carcinoma. So we attribute between around 70% in some areas in the world, up to 80% of squamous cell cervical carcinoma to HPV 16 and 18. And in comparison, it's 78% of the adenocarcinoma is attributable to those two types. Using a HPV test allows us to do individual risk-based assessment. And we do do partial genotyping for those two important types, 16 and 18. So a negative oncogenic HPV test is protective for at least five years. And we're going to look at that a bit more. So HPV. This is what it's all about. We are going to have to talk about HPV a lot more. That is the test we are doing for women. They're the results we're going to get. So we've got to be really confident about our discussion and education around HPV infection. This is the remarkable thing, that cervical cancer is the first solid tumour to be shown to be virally induced in essentially every case. And there are extraordinary implications for that. So, what I'm going to do is just give you a few moments. This is a little true-false quiz. Just, just think about your answers yourself, maybe write them down. We're going to come back to this. 
shortly after we've actually talked through the issues, um, the important things around HPV. So just have a think for a few moments about each of those statements and whether they're true or false. Okay, so we'll come back to those. So that the oncogenic HPV story is much bigger than cervical cancer. So the estimate is that it is responsible for around 5% of all cancers worldwide. So the, um, the outcomes from particularly HPV vaccination are going to be particularly interesting to watch in the coming decades. There are more than 100 types of HPV um, and we can divide them broadly into four groups that are important in humans. So firstly, types one and two are important in the production of skin warts, common garden everyday skin warts. Types five and eight are responsible for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and also for this um, rare autosomal recessive disease that's incredibly debilitating, which is epidermodysplasia verrucaformis. And then the final two groups, which we're particularly interested in today. So uh, those that cause anogenital warts, and that's particularly type six and 11, and those that are responsible for anogenital carcinoma. And of, there's quite a lot of them as we'll see, but certainly the most significant are types 16 and 18. We have to have a really good way of approaching HPV and this is a great way to think about it. This is the phrase that was coined by Professor Hammond and he says that we should think of HPV as the common cold of sexual activity. So I think there's two really important components to that. Firstly, that this is a normal everyday occurrence. If you're a sexually active person, you're going to be exposed to HPV. And it's particularly likely that we would have active HPV infection present in the early years after commencement of sexual activity. Another element of that is because this is so common, everyday, normal, we don't have to think about it in quite the same way as we do other sexually transmitted infections. So in particular, we don't have to be concerned about checking other partners or doing any tracing of anyone when we find positive HPV in women. The second important element is thinking about our response to viruses. So if we get a common cold, so the rhinovirus, we feel a bit unwell, a bit of a fever, a bit of a sore throat, runny nose, but we fully expect to get completely better. So our immune system responds as it should. We get better after time and we have no ongoing consequences from that. And that is exactly the same thing with anogenital HPV. What we get instead are some cellular changes or now we're testing for the presence of HPV, so we might see active infection. But if we leave it alone, in almost every case, our immune system is going to clear that and there are not going to be any consequences from that very common infection. If we focus in on those anogenital types, there are more than 40 of those. They are readily transmitted by skin-skin and mucosa-mucosa contact. It is, however, possible to transmit HPV on fomites, especially if there is immediate contact from one person to the next. And the, the most likely place that that would happen is with the use of sex toys. But if you get this infection, the mean duration that you will have it is eight to 10 months, and almost all of them are cleared within two years, regardless of whether they are low or high risk type. Your age is very important here as well. So if you are under 25, you are particularly good at clearing these infections and having them have no ongoing impact on you. Those anogenital types are divided into these two important groups. So firstly, the low risk types, the most important being types six and 11, but there are a few others. 
Type 6 and 11 are responsible for 90% of genital warts and I'm sure you're aware because of the shorter time frame of development of genital warts, we've seen a rapid reduction in the number of genital warts presenting since the introduction of the vaccination program. But importantly, they are also responsible for 100% of recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, which is a very rare disease, but very debilitating in children and very difficult to treat. So that's going to be another positive outcome of um, vaccination. The ones we really want to focus on are these oncogenic types. So they are the high risk types. Type 16 on its own by far is the most important. It's responsible for more than 50% of cases of cervical cancer around the world. If you add type 18 to it, that gives you somewhere between 70 and 80% of cases, varying a little bit depending on which part of the world you're looking at. But there are 12 others that have the possibility of producing cancer ultimately. So this gives us the 14 oncogenic types that our new primary screening tests are looking for. So our new primary screening test tests for all 14 of those, tells us whether it's the most significant type 16 and 18, or whether it's one of the other 12, which, have, which carry slightly lower risk. So when our tests say that HPV is detected, that means oncogenic HPV. So if your test says there is no HPV detected, there could well be low risk types, but none of those have the potential to cause a problem. And this is the reason, this is integration. What usually happens with a HPV infection, so this is just a representation of a cell with the nucleus here, this is the cell DNA. HPV is a double-stranded DNA virus. What it usually does is gets into the cell nucleus but stays as an episome. It stays separate from the cell DNA. The oncogenic types have the potential to integrate, which is what's happening over here. So instead of saying separated from the cell DNA, they become incorporated into the cell DNA. And it is that change that gives you the potential for cancer. It doesn't mean that cancer will be inevitable, but it is a necessary element. It's only when you get that, that you get significant change in cell growth and the possibility of cancer down the track. And you can only get that with the oncogenic types. So this oncogenic HPV is responsible for essentially all cervical cancer but also almost all anal cancer, a significant proportion of oropharyngeal cancer, as well as vaginal, vulval and penile cancer. It is going to be very interesting to see what the future holds. This is looking at the natural history then of HPV infection. This is the stuff that we are going to have to communicate to women confidently. So we start with our uninfected woman, She's very likely to be exposed to a HPV type. If we test her when she's got infection there, we're going to get a potentially a positive result if that's an oncogenic type. And perhaps um, some cellular changes as well on cytology. But more than 95% of those, will, if we leave them alone, they will clear and will revert to an uninfected woman. The small percentage that are left, if they're oncogenic types, they may persist and progress. This generally is about a, a five to 10 year time frame, And then they may move to a higher grade abnormality. Even when you get here, the majority of those, if you did nothing, would regress. So only 5% of CIN2 up to 30% of CIN3 would then progress further, and you're looking at about another 10 year time frame generally to cervical cancer itself. So this natural history gives us plenty of opportunity to intervene. Now, firstly, to prevent infection in the first place with our vaccination, but then all of these years to intervene with our secondary prevention, which is our screening program. 
Another important thing to understand about HPV is latency because it can be really relevant to some of your clinical discussions as I'm sure many of you have encountered in the past. Um, viral latency, I have to say, is one of the areas about HPV that is still not very well understood. The immune response to HPV is very complex. Um, and it's still, it's quite a difficult thing for us to measure and assess. HPV is very clever, as many viruses are, at evading the immune system. It is likely that in some cases you can retain a small um, amount of HPV in the basal epithelial cells in the cervix that is undetectable with our current testing methods. So they would have negative results and that that could reactivate at some later time down the track. So your overall likelihood of having reactivated HPV is related to your cumulative exposure. So the more, essentially the more partners you've had, the more types of HPV you may have been exposed to, the more infections you have had, there's a greater chance you could have some uh, dormant HPV present. So then it makes sense that newly detected HPV in older women is that it's more likely that some of those cases would be reactivation than if you get HPV infection in a young woman. It does require, that reactivation requires some form of immune suppression, which may be very subtle, <clears throat> or also perhaps some local tissue damage to reactivate that HPV. And if you've got essentially an immune competent host, even if you get reactivation, in most cases that is suppressed rapidly by the memory of your intact immune system. But this is, this is something to be mindful of in women who have been in mutually monogamous relationships for a really long time, and then they show a positive. So it's an important part of the information that is provided in that setting. Overall, that natural history so less than 10% of all HPV infections will persist to any degree, and that is whether they are low risk or high risk oncogenic types. The progression just to high grade changes, and that is not cancer, takes five to 10 years. And from that point, invasive cancer is a rare outcome. Okay, so let's go back to our quiz. So, HPV is not transmitted on fomites. False, yes. I mean, having said that, you, do, you need to think about that a little bit more. You know, you're not gonna get it from your friend's towel, for instance. It does have to be very immediate contact to contact. Um, what about oncogenic HPV infection is likely to produce cervical cancer over time? False. The important word there is likely, yeah? So it is in fact very unlikely and that's important because women do get very concerned as soon as they get a positive result, don't they? So it's really important that we can convey that our understanding of that natural history. Um, most sexually active people have been infected with HPV. True, yes. Very normal part of life. HPV causes a number of cancers in addition to cervical cancer. True, yeah, and I think this is going to be fascinating to watch over time. Um, L-cell H, H cell changes are a direct result of HPV infection. Yeah, true. Um, and we've got to be a lot clearer about this now. You know, sometimes we try to avoid talking about HPV, perhaps when we had cytology changes as the primary thing we were looking at, but you cannot. The changes that occur on cervical cells are a result of HPV. Progression from HPV infection to cancer usually occurs within 10 years. False, yes. False, it's a really slow process. Even if you're one of the very unlucky ones that is going to go from your oncogenic infection to invasive cancer eventually, that process is almost always greater than 10 years. And HPV infection can reactivate many years after its initial clearance. True, yep. 
The other very exciting thing in HPV, of course, is vaccination, especially exciting in Queensland because that is the home of Ian Fraser. Um, so we have had three types of HPV vaccines, of course, the, the quadrivalent Gardasil, so 6 and 11 preventing genital warts, 16 and 18, the two most significant causes of anogenital cancer. Uh, and that had approval for, for females 9 to 45 and males 9 to 26. There is Cervarix, which just has the two oncogenic strains approved there for females only. And now, of course, Gardasil 9. So Gardasil 9 adds five more of those oncogenic types to our original four, two of which are low risk, not oncogenic, of course. The incremental improvement, of course, is not huge because we already had the two most important ones. So we've gone from preventing somewhere between 70 to 80% to being able to prevent around 90%. And it has the same approval as the original Gardasil 4. We are world leaders in primary prevention of um, HPV. Uh, the Gardasil, once it became available, was very rapidly brought into the National Immunisation Program. So as you will be very well aware, we had the catch-up program that started in 2007 for two years, trying to capture as many women under 27 as we could with Gardasil 4. From 2009, we have vaccinated all girls first year of high school. In 2013, we added the boys with a very brief catch-up program. Since July last year, we have had the opportunity for ongoing catch-up of individuals between 10 and 19, which is fantastic. So that's something we need to be proactive about with our patients. And of course, this year, the very exciting step of a two-dose Gardasil 9 schedule being introduced into the schools program. A really important thing about the two-dose Gardasil 9 schedule is that you must be under 15 when you start that to be eligible for two-dose, otherwise it's still a three-dose schedule. So we'll look at some of the big questions that have come up about all these changes and this is probably the biggest. So why has the recommended age for commencing screening been raised to 25 years? The science here is irrefutable. So this is looking at uh, three-year cervical cancer incidence, all ages included. So the little green triangles are all cervical cancer considered together. So this is from the early 1980s to um, 2010. So you can see what we saw on the earlier graphs that we had one, with the organised approach, we had a marked reduction in cervical cancer, but we've had a plateauing in more recent times. If you split those into squamous cell carcinoma, the red squares, and adenocarcinoma, the blue circles, you can see that that is all attributable to a reduction in squamous cell carcinoma. No effect on adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> so that's all ages together. But if we divide up the ages, so the three on the right, 25 to 49 years, 50 to 69 years, and over 70 years. And this is just looking at the division of squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. You can see that mirrors fairly well the all age together graph. So in each of those age groups, we have had marked reduction in squamous cell carcinoma. No impact on adenocarcinoma. These are the women between 20 and 24. So there are two really important things to note here. <clears throat> the overall incidence is very, very low. It is not zero. We do not pretend that nobody under 25 gets cervical cancer, but it is incredibly rare. And no screening program has had an impact on it. So in all of that time, the 1980s to recently, there has been absolutely no impact on the low incidence of cervical cancer in women under 25. The other part of this is to think back again to HPV. 
So this is cervical high-grade abnormality. So essentially that equates to oncogenic HPV infection detected by age. So we expect to see HPV infection quite commonly in younger women. It's the early years of sexual activity you would expect to find HPV infection. What we don't want is those women ending up with unnecessary investigations and certainly not unnecessary treatment. So 25 years of screening women under 25 has had no impact whatsoever. And nowhere in any country has there been evidence for screening effectiveness in that group. The incidence overall is very low. And also, of course, this is the group who's going to have the highest rates of HPV vaccination and be protected the earliest. The International Agency for Research on Cancer for many years has clearly stated that we should not be screening women are under 25 for cervical cancer that the harms outweigh any benefits in that group. And that is the thing we have to be mindful of, that you can do harm if you test unnecessarily. And to underscore this now in our new program, there is no Medicare rebate available for screening in women under 25 because there is no grounds to support it. That is different from women who you are concerned about for some reason. That then falls outside screening, and we're going to talk about a couple of those areas more particularly, but they are women who are symptomatic with concerns that you think might be indicative of cervical cancer. That is not screening, that is testing, and you can certainly test those women, and it is covered by Medicare. The other obvious group are women under 25 who have had abnormalities already. And there is certainly provision for those women to be followed as they would have been in the old program. So we will we'll come back to that. Just while we're talking about ages, what about the other end? What about the women aged 70 to 74? So essentially now we're looking at a five yearly cervical screening test. CST is our new terminology from 25 to 74. With a five yearly test, then obviously somewhere between 70 and 74, you're gonna come up to hopefully your final test. Um, the, we are moving away from this concept of exit testing because it is going to depend what that test result is. So it's only going to be your final test if you actually get a low risk result. So that is no oncogenic HPV detected. Obviously, if there's anything else, we're still going to follow the guidelines for that person until they've returned to essentially routine screening. Just out of interest, because you may have women ask, women over 75 can continue to screen. Um, there will be Medicare coverage for that, but they will fall outside the register services. So there won't be invitations or reminders for those women. The next big question is, why has the interval been increased from two years to five years? And to understand this, you have to understand the concepts of screening and of screening tests. So screening, of course, means examining or testing well individuals so that you can detect a disease or significant risk factors and you also have to be able to change that outcome. So we're trying to accurately separate these people, the people who are well, from these people who have the disease. And different tests have different abilities to do that. So if you have a highly sensitive test, you can accurately tell who's well but you tend to have higher false positives as a consequence. Whereas at the other end, if you've got a highly specific test, you usually, you're right when you say someone has the disease, but you also tend to have higher false negative rates. So in terms of cervical screening, our pap smear that we used for so long is very specific. So if it said there's something wrong, then there 
was something wrong, but we have always accepted that it had a relatively high false negative rate of around 15%. And that's why we needed to repeat it very frequently. In contrast, our HPV testing, which we have moved to, has much greater sensitivity. If it says there's nothing there, then there's nothing there. The false negative rate is very, very small. So that means that it's got this high negative predictive value. You can trust that result and you can extend your screening interval. HPV testing itself has more reliable clinical performance too. Um, <clears throat> it, meaning that if you get a sample from somewhere in the area, you'll get a, a reasonable HPV result. We as clinicians collecting these results still need to think about the cytology sample that may be needed. So we'll stress that some more, but we still need to be as careful with the sample we are now collecting as we always have been. We need a good cytological sample in case that test has got to go on and have the liquid-based cytology done. The other huge positive, of course, for HPV testing, as we've mentioned, is it is going to give us a greater possibility for detecting glandular abnormalities. So this looks at the different screening tests. So, and, um, so in blue is women screened by cytology. So they've all started with zero at the beginning, so a negative screening test. If you look at the women who had negative cytology at point zero and follow them over time, so this, they were followed over six years. At two years, here we have the incidence of high grade abnormality, so CIN three or greater. So at two years, the incidence of that is 40 per 10,000. The red line is the women screened with HPV testing. So if you have a negative HPV test at point zero and you look at it at five years, the same um, incidence is 20. So you have half the rate of high grade abnormalities at five years as you have at two years with a pap test. So we've got significantly lower risk with a five year interval compared to a two year interval with our previous testing. So that has brought us to this, our National Cervical Screening Program. So what does it mean for women? Um, I'm sure this is the thing that women are most disappointed about. They heard, no more pap smears. But sadly, that doesn't change that they need the exact same examination. Not at this point anyway, the future will hold many more changes in this area. It is a very exciting field. But right now, we've got to inform women that they still need the same examination. Um, they're going to be invited now, not just kind of wait till they're overdue and then be reminded. So that same sample is going to be taken from the cervix. But if they need cytology, provided we've taken the appropriate sample, that's just done on that same sample that we sent first up. As always, they'll receive their results from their provider. The test results are going to be kept in one place in the National Register, which is also a wonderful step forward. We have to remove PAP from our terminology. So it's going to be hard, I think, after all these years, but we have to get used to not talking about PAPs anymore. Our new test is the cervical screening test, CST. So that was, um, that was preferred to just having a standard HPV test because people still don't like talking about HPV unless they're me. So um, CST is your terminology to get used to. So the, the short term for cervical screening test. Different test for us, exactly the same collection procedure. We want to visualise that cervix very well. We want a good sample of squamous cells. We want to cross the transformation zone and ideally get a sample of endocervical cells to show that we have sampled the correct area. Very important for us to be really mindful of that. It is, of course, direct to vial. We just don't have to prepare those slides anymore. 
So um, the other thing is writing on our pathology request forms because we're so used to what we've done for so long that we have to get used to these new terms. So the most common one we're going to use is CST and you can just write CST. The other two most common things that you would write on a pathology request form in this setting is co-test. Now, if you write co-test, that is asking the lab to do both the HPV and the cytology, regardless of what one is. So the normal thing, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, is with a CST, they will test for HPV. And if that is negative for all types, the cytology is not done. If it's positive, then the cytology is automatically done. If you ask for a co-test, both of those things will be done by the lab. The two major times you're going to ask for a co-test are in someone with symptoms where you are concerned they may be indicative of cervical cancer. And the second one is follow-up of treated high-grade abnormalities because that's how we do our test of cure, which actually is no change from what we have done. We just were asking for the two things separately. So it's a co-test. The third thing that you might fairly commonly be writing is HPV test. And that, the places where that is going to be what you write, is in someone who's had a low grade in the transition time. They've had a, a recent low grade abnormality and this is essentially their 12 month follow up. And this is also what you write for the intermediate risk people when they come back for their 12 month follow up. And we'll look at that again. So they're the three main things that you're going to be writing on a pathology request form. The other thing that's really important is of course as always that we include all relevant clinical notes you need to be accurate if you're concerned about symptoms don't just write symptoms write what they are the lab cannot give us accurate recommendations if we do not give them the information they need the other thing is i think that it really should sit with clinicians to give as much screening history as possible and I'm sure you're all very good at chasing up histories. The labs will also look, but, um, but ideally, when we are writing out our request forms, we should put the screening history and any other concerns we have about symptoms or about appearance of the examination. There is an excellent guide on pathology test requesting so and that's the link to it if you want to look at that a little bit more it will really help you with what you need to write on your request form so we have to get used to our new kind of banter around talking to women in relation to the new program things like this is more accurate therefore we can use it less less often we are looking for the virus that causes the problem so we're not looking for cancer we are assessing your risk that cancer might develop at some point in the future. And I just put this here because I think that's what you have to talk to women about. You have to understand the natural history of HPV. You have to be able to explain it with confidence and in a way that women will understand. The laboratory report. So I'm sure you will have all seen these since we've been looking at them now since the 1st of December last year. And they give us a risk assessment. So low risk, intermediate risk, or higher risk. They also tell us with clarity what the tests performed were and what the results of each of those tests were. <clears throat> and as always, they give us a recommendation. The two easiest ones in terms of what to do clinically next are the low risk and the higher risk. So low risk, obviously, is no oncogenic HPV detected. And that's easy. We just have to repeat that in five years. The higher risk, so there's a couple of ways you can end up in the higher risk group. You can have either HPV 16 or 18 detected. So that alone, because they carry the greatest risk of progression to cancer, will put you in the higher risk group. Or you have one of the other 12 oncogenic types 
and your liquid based cytology shows a high grade abnormality or a glandular abnormality of any kind. So if you fit one of those two categories, you need referral for colposcopy. The intermediate risk is the perhaps the trickier group. To be intermediate, it's a combination of what your HPV result and your liquid-based cytology result is. So the HPV will be detected, but it will be one of the other 12, not 16 or 18. And if the liquid-based cytology associated with that is either negative or low grade, that puts you in the intermediate risk category because we know that you are very likely to clear that yourself. So we want to just send you away and give you a chance to do that and not do anything more at this point. So this, these are the women who in 12 months time need that follow-up HPV test. So on your pathology request form in 12 months time, you'll be writing HPV test and you will be indicating the result from 12 months earlier. When they come back at 12 months and you do the HPV test, if that HPV test is negative, none of those 12 types are there. That is such a good test at predicting no problem that you immediately go back to your five year follow up. So that's a change for us from what we were doing. If at that follow-up test, any HPV is detected, regardless of the, the liquid-based cytology result associated with it, <laughs> you go to colposcopy. Because we're, we are saying that you've got a persistent HPV infection and the persistent with an oncogenic type. So the persistence of a HPV infection is what increases your risk of progressing to cancer. This is the algorithm. This is the basic cervical screening pathway algorithm that goes through all of that. The algorithms are very readily accessible. The, the wiki of the guidelines is fantastic. It's very easy to find. It's very easy to navigate. So whenever you have doubt, you can go there and you can clarify what am I supposed to do next? Yeah. So this is the algorithm and we've just talked about most of it. I just wanted to bring up a couple of other points. It is possible to get an unsatisfactory or rather invalid HPV test. It's very difficult. It doesn't, it's not going to happen very often, but it may occasionally happen. So if you get that as your result, then you need them to come back after six weeks at least. So in six to 12 weeks and repeat that test. If you've got your HPV result, but the reflex cytology is unsatisfactory, so that certainly could happen, then they need to come back after at least six weeks, but just for the liquid-based cytology. You already have a valid HPV test. So that might be a different thing you're writing on the pathology request form. You would then write LBC only. Again, you would be still collecting the exact same sample, but you've got a recent HPV test that is valid, so you just need to repeat the cytology. Interestingly, there have been a couple of things emerged since the 1st of December in the quality of collection. Um, because we've moved to a liquid-based cytology, and it's something we all have to get used to, I guess. Um, two main areas. Lubricants can certainly be a problem if they're washed off into that liquid vial. So you've got to use lubricants that do not have carbomers or carbopol copolymers in them. Um, those are essentially thickening agents. Now, most of you in your practices have probably already changed over to different lubricants, but um, if you have any doubt, you can always talk to the, your pathology provider and they will give you very clear in, information about what lubricants are less likely to cause a problem. The other thing is the endocervical cell rate has dropped off significantly. So 
There's probably a couple of reasons for that. There's possibly not thinking so much about the quality of that sample that people are collecting, thinking, well, it's a HPV test, it's gonna pick up the HPV if I'm somewhere in the right place. So we can't think like that. We have to be as careful as we always have been about getting a good cell sample. Um, and the other thing is transferring those cells from the implements into the liquid vial. So um, you need to be really vigorous with that transfer. You need to really, so the most common implement that we are probably using is that the broom, the cervical sampler. So you really have to press those brushes against the, the container and you have to swish very vigorously. And if you use a cyto brush, same thing, you have to be very, very vigorous to get those cells off the brushes into the liquid. Self-collection. Now, self-collection came about really because of this. So 80% of cervical cancer in Australia occurs in women who have never been screened or who are underscreened. Participation has always been really the biggest factor in cervical cancer rates in Australia. And self-collection is just one part of perhaps trying to address that a little better. The, um, the Commonwealth have come up recognising the importance of this area. So the Commonwealth now have a toolkit for us to access for the women who are underscreened or never screened. And it's to try to help give us some strategies about overcoming barriers. Um, so it's worth having a look and seeing if any of those things are particularly applicable to you that you may be able to utilize effectively for your women. Um, it, it does look at some of the particular specific populations who tend to be underscreened. We have to be aware that there are many different barriers to lack of participation. It, often we tend to assume that it's about the intimate examination, but it certainly is not always that. So you need to have a discussion with women in this setting to try to work out what their barriers are in order to be able to overcome them. It is a, this is a much bigger picture than just self-collection. The ideal is that we can move all of those women to a cl clinician-collected sample. That is the best sample that we can get from those women. But even if you do all of that work and you try to overcome all the barriers, we may still be left with some women who just are not able to have that examination done. And that is the circumstance where self-collection will become very useful. So it's, it's very restricted, the use of self-collection. Um, it is only for those underscreened and never screened women at this point in time, and it is facilitated in a clinical setting. So supervised by a nurse or medical practitioner, it does not mean that there's got to be someone else present at, as the woman collects the sample, but it's really about recognising this is a much bigger factor. We want those women to be very well educated, to have an opportunity to perhaps move towards a clinician collected sample. So we want it all to be done and explained within a clinical setting. So there is very restricted Medicare eligibility for self-collection. You have to be over 30 and have had no recorded screening test in the past or over 30 and more than two years overdue for screening. So that's more than four years if your last test was pap smear. It's more than seven years if your last test was a HPV test. So the point of self-collection is to get to those women who we are not going to be able to do a screen on otherwise. Those are higher risk women. It is not as effective as a clinician collected sample. It is more effective though than our um, long used pap test. It's less cost effective than the routine pathway. We still need, if the HPV is positive for any type, we still need a high quality liquid based sample from those women. So there is still going to be an examination required. So it's only available to under or never screeners. 
There are lots of really great resources. It, this is a vaginal HPV sample, basically. So it's done using a dry, flocked swab. So this is just an example of um, one of the resources that's available. There are excellent resources on self-collection that can be used both to explain to women the process, but also for clinicians thinking about um, self-collection where it's appropriate. This is the pathway for self-collection. It's very similar, if you look in detail, it's very similar to the, the standard pathway. It's just that the cervical sample, if it's required, has got to be collected by a clinician. Now, if these are women in that higher risk group, um, because of their 16 or 18 detection, the LBC sample can be collected at colposcopy. So they may not need an interim clinician review. Um, I would just make everyone aware that these are women, if that's what they've needed, a self-collection, because this has been such a confronting thing for them, it is a big jump from a self-collected vaginal sample to a colposcopy. So I think at the very least, we need to see those women and have a discussion with them about what the next process will involve. Transitions the other thing. So over the next few years anyway, we're going to have a bit of an interesting, trickier time because we're transitioning from our old program to our new program. So um, one of the big messages that we must be clear about is that if your last screening test was a cytology sample, was a pap smear, you are due after two years. There has been a little bit of misconception about, yay, it's gone to five years. So people thinking that they don't have to turn up now for five years. But of course, that is not the case. Cytology has got false negative rates. We need them screened again after two years. It's only once you get your new test, your new CST, that the five years becomes valid. So the majority are going to be women who were between 23 and 70 at their last test. And they're just going to be invited to screen when they're due for their next test, so after two years. The, one of the tricky groups is the women who were less than 23 at their last test. So they are going to be advised that they don't need a test until they're 25 and given some explanation about that. And also they will be invited when they're due just before 25 to come along for their new screening test. Um, but this is the group of women where we may need to do some additional education and explanation about why this is happening, that this is a very good thing, it's very positive, it is to reduce unnecessary investigating and treatment that may have occurred in the past, which is the problem. We have to really admit that maybe we shouldn't have been doing all this stuff before. So you have to be very open and very confident with that discussion. For those women who are more than 25 and they're overdue by less than two years, they're going to be um, reminded to come and screen. For those women who are over 30 and more than two years overdue, they fit into the eligibility for self-collect and they're going to be given information that that may be a possibility, which may perhaps bring them along to screening when they never have come before. It still then gives you an opportunity to talk through all of this with them and look particularly at what their barriers are. Um, and women 70 to 75 are going to be invited to have a test, which may or may not be their exit test, depending on what it shows. The other really important transition group are the women who at their last test had an abnormal result. So they're still in active follow-up for abnormals. And the very important thing here is that this is regardless of age. So um, we touched on this before. So if we've got women who've had a previous low-grade abnormality, they would be expecting to screen again at 12 months. So essentially these women with existing abnormalities, we just want them to come along when they were due to come along anyway. And then we can do the new tests and we can explain the new guidelines. 
So they will still come along at 12 months, but they will have their HPV test, is what we're going to request. And then the positive for them is that if there's no oncogenic HPV, they can go away for five years straight away because we are so confident with that result. And as we said before, any detected HPV, they will go for further assessment for colposcopy. Um, those who have had a treated high-grade abnormality, so squamous abnormality, CIN2 or CIN3, they need to continue until they complete a test of cure, which really has not changed from what we have been doing since the last guideline change in 2007. So they need two sets of negative HPV test and cytology to return to routine screening, which will be five yearly this time. We call that now a co-test. So we write co-test and that's their HPV plus their cytology. And they do that annually until they get two negatives. For those who've had um, treated adenocarcinoma in situ, now they require an annual co-test indefinitely. So again, you've got this algorithm, it's there, it's readily available, that you can check if you're not sure. There are a whole lot of specific populations that are addressed in the guidelines. I, my feeling is that these new guidelines give us a lot more information than our previous guidelines. If you've got a clinical situation that you're not sure about, you're far more likely to find it covered now in these guidelines. So um, these are some of the main specific populations that are addressed in the new guidelines. So we'll just talk about some of those a bit more. So our Abo Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are, are a very important group that, as I'm sure you're aware, they have significantly higher incidence and mortality from cervical cancer. Another group to think of in a similar context are our women from different cultural and language backgrounds. And they, they share a lot of the same barriers and difficulties. Participation is a big problem in this group. And the, the, um, in the new guidelines, there is an attempt to address some of these issues to make um, more uh, appropriate services available, to think very specifically about how you can deliver invitations and reminders and how you can ensure um, accurate follow up because women in these groups fall out of the participation and they fall out of effective follow up. So there is an attempt to try to improve that. These are some of the groups where self collection may well make a big difference. We need to remember that to be very good at including identifiers when we are doing um, our pathology forms because we need to improve data collection in order to identify issues that still need to be addressed. Pregnant women. So this hasn't changed, but just a point worth making that pregnant women should be offered screening if it's due or overdue at any time of their pregnancy. There is absolutely no reason that cervical screening would have an adverse effect on pregnancy. We use correct implements, as I'm sure you know, which is the, usually the cervix sampler, not a cyto brush, not a combi brush. Not because those things would do any harm, but because they're more likely to produce bleeding, which would then make a pregnant woman very anxious. Self-collection is not recommended in pregnancy, and the management is exactly the same. In particular, if the recommendation is to go to colposcopy, they should go to colposcopy. Now, this, we're not going to go through this in detail, don't worry. Um, but, but I wanted to put it up there because the great thing about this is that it gives us an algorithm to follow for our women post-hysterectomy because I'm sure all of you have faced this clinically. There are lots of different scenarios post-hysterectomy and to, up until the new guidelines, it's been difficult sometimes to know what to do because it hasn't actually been clearly stated. Well, now most of them are stated in this algorithm. So go to it and follow your pathway and you will almost certainly get an answer. Um, the bottom line 
is that if you've got someone who has had routine screening or perhaps has had a problem but has returned to routine screening and has a hysterectomy for benign reasons, they do not require further cervical screening. And apart from that, it gets a bit more complex. But it does make sense and it's great that we've got it. Um, the immune deficient women are another important group and I think this has been made clearer as well. So essentially immune deficient women should be screened every three years and if any HPV is detected they go to colposcopy with a uh, liquid based cytology result for further assessment. Uh, so I think the thing that we need to think about is who is immune deficient. So the two big groups are women who are HIV positive and uh, women who have had organ transplants. But this also applies to, there are rare women who have primary immunodeficiency syndromes, and we have some of our women who are on significant immunosuppressant medication for other medical conditions. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a, a fairly common example of that. So uh, if you've got a woman in any of those categories, they just go to their three yearly screening with colposcopy if there's any HPV detected. This is another area that has caused people a lot of angst, I think. So it's the women with very early sexual activity and um, women who've been victims of child sexual abuse. Now, if you think again about HPV and its natural history, these women are almost certainly safe to wait until 25 to begin screening. We're going to be looking at a cohort that's vaccinated almost certainly as well. But if you get HPV when you are young, you are usually very, very good at clearing it and it is unlikely to cause you a problem. If it is going to persist, it generally takes a long time to cause any significant change. So routine screening at 25 is almost certainly perfectly safe in this group, regardless of age at, of first sexual contact. But there is provision in the new guidelines, as you can see there, to consider a single HPV test between the ages of 20 and 24, if you think it is warranted. Just a reminder, of course, that as soon as someone has symptoms that you have a concern about, that is not screening. And the under 25 age becomes irrelevant. So talking a little bit more about symptomatic women. In this context, we are talking about symptoms that you have some concern may indicate cervical cancer. We are not talking about every symptom there is. So you to, in order to order a co-test in this context, you need to have some concern that perhaps there is significant cervical abnormality. Now the biggest group there is going to be abnormal bleeding. So post bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding. Um, post bleeding or occasional intermenstrual bleeding, particularly in a young population, are far more likely to be due to benign causes. So we really have to think clinically and make sure we've excluded those other causes. Again, we do not want women unnecessarily having colposcopies and having treatment to their cervix if that is not warranted. So abnormal bleeding is the number one thing to make you think about this. The second thing, so that because this has been an area that people seem to have had some difficulty with, there have been a lot of tests sent in under this symptomatic um, heading, which probably was not really appropriate. So um, the Commonwealth Group have done some work on trying to clarify what is meant by relevant symptoms. And under that heading is also unusual vaginal discharge, particularly if it's offensive and or bloodstained. Now, we all know there are many, many benign causes of vaginal discharge. So we have to think about all of those 
and exclude them really before we're going to think that maybe this is due to cervical abnormality. Um, deep dyspareunia again, if it really doesn't seem to fit other common clinical pictures, then that may be a reason to, to order this as well. And the other thing you need to be mindful of is if you have some concern about what you're seeing clinically, you know, sometimes you just look at cervixes and you think, mm, I really don't like how that cervix looks. So that's an area you need to be mindful of as well. So if you think a woman sits into any of those categories and you have some concern that that cervix is not normal, then you can order a co-test, which as we said before, means that they will have a HPV and a cytology done on the sample that you send in. But make sure you've really thought through it clinically and you think that that is a valid reason to send a co-test. Again, we've got an algorithm to help us when we think about abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, and the one I just want to kind of highlight a little bit is over here. So post coital bleeding, we of course always sit up and take notice of post coital bleeding because it can indicate cervical pathology. But, but it can indicate a lot of more common things, especially in younger women. So. The point over here about thinking about sexual health history and especially thinking about chlamydia. We certainly do not want to miss doing our chlamydia test. If you do that co-test and you've done your other assessment and everything has come up okay and you, so your co-test is negative, negative HPV, negative cytology. If it's a single episode in premenopausal women, and you have a clinically normal cervix, then our guidelines say to us, no colposcopy required. What you want to do with those women though, is follow them very closely. So these are the people I would always put a recall on and make sure that I check with them that they have had no further abnormal bleeding. But we really need to apply clinical judgment in these settings. We do not want every single woman going off for colposcopy. The National Cancer Screening Register. So this is another exciting move forward. I'm, I'm sure like me, many of you have chased around multiple states and territories to try to get women's full history. So we will not have to do that in the future. Um, the, the Cancer Screening Register is also linked to the HPV Vaccination Register and it's the base where the invitations and reminders are going to be sent from. So the idea is it's going to give us a full history from vaccination to any diagnosis. And it is going to include um, colposcopy as well as pathology data. It's going to be a great repository for data that will allow us to monitor what's going on in this program and provide um, options for improvement of the service. So the idea is one woman, one record, easy to obtain all the information that we need. As I'm sure you know, the full function of the National Cancer Screening Register has not yet occurred but it should all happen from the 29th of June this year. If you're chasing cervical screening histories before then, um, which you may well have already been doing, you can, of course, you can often get results from your pathology providers, but for results up until the 1st of December, we're still going to our state and territory registers. For any results from the 1st of December, we're going to the National Cancer Screening Register. So it is, it's a little bit trickier at the moment, but that is all going to change soon. So we just have to be a bit patient. And the other thing that I, other point that I was asked to make is that because of this sort of overlap time, we might find as practitioners that we're getting some doubling up of correspondence. We may get some reminders from our state and territory registers and then get the same reminder from the National Register. So we just need to be patient with that. It is far better to get multiple reminders than to have women fall through cracks. But it will all settle down in the not too distant future. Another area, which again, I'm sure you've come up against in your practices, is that not all of the software systems have caught up with the 
the new national cervical screening program and it's very difficult if your software program does not have the information you need it's very difficult to record the results accurately and then to put in the recalls that you need for your patients so if you're having any problems with that if they're not yet aligned with the renewal then we'll, we're going to need to be proactive and contact those vendors so that we can make sure that that the change is facilitated This is not a set and forget. We're not just you know, making all these enormous changes and then ignoring them. There's a very complex quality and safety monitoring committee. It is chaired by Professor David Roder and I don't, if you've ever met him, you would have enormous faith in the, um, the structure of this quality and safety committee. It's very particular. So there are a lot of protocols that are going to be monitoring this change over time. And there's a very clear framework about ensuring quality and safety. Okay, so we might move on to some of these cases, which is really just trying to put some of this into clinical context. And you can certainly feel free to um, ask questions around any of these matters as well. So firstly, we've got a couple of cases thinking about transitioning to the new program. So if we have a woman who's 23 and she's been really good, she's come for her pap smears, she's had them at 19 and 21, they were both normal. She's got no symptoms she's worried about, but she's back for her pill script and because she's so good at having her screening, she says, oh, and I also need my pap smear. I think I'm a few months overdue. So <clears throat> we're going to do the old fashioned um, show of hands. I promise I won't pick you out, so don't worry. We just want a sense of what the room is thinking. So which of the following is not true? So. Just have a read through them all for a moment first. So remember she's 23, perfectly well as far as we know. So not true. So does anyone say no screening as she's not eligible? She should have a CST as requested. Be brave. Yeah, not true. Yes, not true. She should have a chlamydia test, but not CST. Yeah, she absolutely should. We'll just, you just see there's a bit of a recurring theme with trying to get everybody to think about chlamydia at the drop of a hat. Um, she should return at age 25 for CST. Yep. And the National Cancer Screening Register will contact her at that time that she's due for screening. Yes, that's right. In contrast, this is another woman who's 23. She had a normal pap smear at age 20, but when she came back and had it at age 22, she had a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Again, she has no symptoms that she is concerned about, and she's come for her pill script and her pap smear. She's not sure quite when it's due, but she thought she had to come back a bit earlier for it. So for her, what are we going to recommend? Just have a quick look. So are we going to recommend a 12 month follow up pap smear? No, because we've stopped talking about or thinking about pap smears now. Um, no testing because she's under 25? No. Uh, Co-test? Who thinks yes? Just a um, show of hands. Thank you. Um, a HPV test? Yeah, a few of you. A chlamydia test and a HPV test. Yay! Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is, it does get a little bit tricky here, as we saw, because there, there was a bit of difference in opinion there in the room. So, this is the person who's transitioning, who has had a previous abnormal. Her previous abnormal was a low grade. So we stick to the same interval that she was recommended, which was come back at 12 months. 
But what we're requesting, this is not screening. So it's not going to be a CST. This is someone who's being followed up for a previous abnormality. This person, because she had a low-grade abnormality, we're going to request a HPV test. Yeah? But because she's a sexually active 23-year-old, ideally we would also do a chlamydia test. Um, cervical screening in pregnancy. So this is a 28-year-old woman who has one child. So she's got... Um, <laughs> We've asked her, and this is a mutually monogamous relationship. Um, she's got one child who's three. Six months ago, she had a miscarriage at 10 weeks of pregnancy. Her LMP was seven weeks ago, and she's just had a positive pregnancy test. So she's here to talk with you about the pregnancy. She doesn't have any symptoms she's worried about. You note on her history that her last pap smear was four years ago. She's worried about having any examination and certainly about having a CST collected because of her pregnancy. So which of these is or are not, uh, sorry, are true? So screening is not recommended in pregnancy due to her history of previous miscarriage. Yeah, that's not true. Um, Self-collection is recommended in pregnancy. Not true. The spatula is the best implement to use in pregnancy. Okay, so there's, there's both answers there. So we'll come back to that. CST should be offered at this visit. Mm -hmm. A co-test is recommended for pregnant women. Great. Okay, so spatula. So some people said yes, some people said no. Um, and it's there for exactly that reason. So a spatula, can, it can be safely used in pregnancy. It's just that largely we've moved away from spatulas as the best implement for anything, really. We certainly don't use wooden spatulas because they suck up cellular material. So if a if a plastic spatula is the only thing you have, it can be safely used in pregnancy. But ideally, we want to be using cervix samplers. We want to be using the broom, not the combi brush, the cervix sampler broom that's very soft and malleable. So that's the point about the spatula. Um, CST should be offered at this visit. Is there any kind of corollary to that? So yes, basically, we've got someone who is already two years overdue for cervical screening and we've got an opportunity to offer that to her. I think we just have to be really mindful of this woman's position. So she, not very long ago, had a miscarriage at 10 weeks. You're going to have to judge her, her level of anxiety and also the likelihood that she's going to return for further review. It may be appropriate to defer this. The biggest risk time, of course, is the first 12 weeks, and she's had a miscarriage at 10 weeks. Um, we've, got, we've got a really important role to confidently explain to her that it cannot do her any harm, and that she may get a tiny bit of bleeding, and that that is not anything to be concerned about. But if when you've had that discussion you are still left with an incredibly anxious woman, you may choose to defer the CST until she's past that 12-week risk time. The problem we run up against here is that if a CST has been done and there is a negative outcome, women tend to put those two things together, even though that's not actually the case. So. Um, the, the point here is just for us to be really mindful of the individual clinical setting. We certainly want to ensure that this woman gets a CST as soon as is possible. So this woman is 58 and she's come for her CST. Her last pap smear was four years ago also and it was negative. 
she was menopausal six years ago and she's not used any HRT and she's, she's well otherwise, she's not on any medication. She's recently started a new relationship. So we do the CST and we note that the speculum examination is somewhat uncomfortable for her. So um, this is her result. So the HPV testing has shown that she has a non-16-18 oncogenic type. So she's got one of those other 12. Her liquid-based cytology says unsatisfactory due to marked inflammation. Okay, so which one of these is best practice is what we should do next. So 58, last pap smear four years ago, normal in the past. And she's got type, she's got HPV non-16-18 and unsatisfactory LBC. So we're going to refer her to the CULP and have a liquid-based sample taken at that visit? No. Great. Are we going to refer her to CULP? No. Um, we recall her for a cervix sample and request a CST. Recall for a cervix sample, request HPV and LBC. Recall for a cervix sample and request LBC only. Yes. So this is that case where we've already got our HPV test. We've got a current valid result, but we do not have a current valid cytology result. What else are we going to do? as good clinicians. Sorry? Oh yes, we are, very good. <laughs> That's wonderful, I love that you've got that message. Because it says she's had a new partner, doesn't it? So she needs an STI screen, what else does she need? What did we notice when we did the examination? Yes, absolutely. So two things really, the examination was uncomfortable and that is likely to be the reason for the unsatisfactory cytology, that we've got atrophic vaginitis and um, cervical changes. So for her comfort, as well as for optimising the result for the repeat LBC only, we want her to have the vaginal oestrogen. Hopefully we took those STIs, STI samples at the first visit, yeah? Okay, we're nearly there. We'll... So this person's 72, pap smear negative four years ago, no history of abnormal results. She had a CST two weeks ago. She had not 1618 detected, liquid-based cytology, no evidence of any abnormality. So what's next? So no follow-up required because she's 72 and she's had a history of negative pap smears. Repeat CST in five years. Repeat HPV in 12 months. Yep, co-test in 12 months, anybody? Repeat LBC in six to 12 weeks. Maybe. She, do you know, what group does she fit in? Low, intermediate, higher risk? Uh, intermediate. Yes, absolutely, intermediate. So the follow-up for intermediate? At 12 months. What at 12 months? HPV. Yes, HPV test at 12 months, exactly. So even though, she, the, you know, this is the person who was really hoping this was her last cervical screening test, but she's not going to get away with that because she had um, an oncogenic HPV detected. So she's intermediate risk, so she's got to be tested again in 12 months with a HPV test, is what you're requesting. Postcardial bleeding, we're back to our women under 25. She's been on the pill for two years, she's got a new partner. One episode, a single episode, you ask questions in great detail, which sometimes you wish you hadn't, I'm sure, because if you ask enough about bleeding, you'll usually get some. <laughs> um, and the, the examination was perfectly normal. 
So what are we going to do now? She's 23, one episode of postcultural bleeding, new partner. So just have a look at all of these first. Are we going to do a chlamydia test plus other testing if indicated? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, are we going to do a CST? Co-test and if negative review if she has more bleeding. Co-test and repeat in six months. Co-test and refer. One and three. Yeah, one and three. So um, the really important thing here is to think the most likely cause for that is something quite straightforward, particularly perhaps chlamydia or perhaps the you know, new partner. How good has she been at taking her OCP? Has she had some missed pills? Lots of things are much more likely to cause that than concern about her cervix. So there is provision in our new algorithms. If we are happy clinically and we've done the basic tests that are fine, then um, we can just monitor those women, make sure you have them on recall. This is the last case, a 40 year old woman, Nully Gravid, a regular partner. She's got intermittent light intermenstrual bleeding over the last eight weeks. She had a pap smear a year ago, which was negative and you can't see anything abnormal with her cervix, a little bit of blood in the vagina. Which of these would you do? A sexual history and a chlamydia test? Yep, we're all doing chlamydia tests all the time. <laughs> um, a transvaginal ultrasound scan? A CST, and if negative, review if persists? Good on you. Co-test? Refer. <coughs> Is anyone doing a co-test? Yes? It, it just didn't sound like it when we went through. Um, look, the, really the point here is that in these complex situations, you have got to apply clinical judgment once again. Bleeding, abnormal bleeding is very difficult, I think, clinically. Um, if in doubt, you know, use your colleagues to talk about cases. It's difficult. We want to keep these women safe, but we also do not want to over-investigate and treat women. So certainly sexual history and chlamydia test, vaginal ultrasound, um, it's not a CST, this is a symptomatic person, so it's not screening, it's a co-test that's appropriate. And certainly, depending on all of that, it may still be appropriate to refer, or you may come up with an answer. Okay, just finally, you've got lots of fabulous resources in relation to the new cervical screening guidelines. So if in doubt, go to those resources. The wiki of the guidelines is fantastic. Um, you can contact the um, cervical renewal people if you have questions. You are welcome to contact me at Iris Education as well. I'll have some cards out here if you want them. There's wonderful online educational modules that are um, available for all CST providers. The NPS modules are brilliant, interactive, very high quality. Uh, Cancer Council has some online education. The Department of Health, as I mentioned before, has a huge number of resources, both for women and for health professionals, and you can access them very readily. This primary HPV screening program is going to lead to up to a 30% further reduction in the incidence and death from cervical cancer. It all comes back to HPV. So 80 to 90% of people will be infected with HPV at some point. The most likely outcome is spontaneous resolution, but it is the most significant infectious cause of cancer in Australia. And that gives us this unprecedented opportunity for primary and secondary prevention. It's exciting stuff. Thank you.